ministry of the word, let's take pause to uh, pray once again together. <clears throat> Father, um, as we come into your presence, coming before your throne of grace, to find help and mercy in our time of need, we thank you that we are able to do so. Uh, we thank you that we are able to come to your throne and that we are invited to do so boldly. And Lord, you know our every need. You know our every struggle. You know our every trial. You know the motivations of our own hearts. And even when sometimes it is difficult for us to know our own motivations, you know it all. And so we thank you, Lord, for your abundant grace, your mercy, for your loving kindness, for your patience. Help us, Lord, to remember how patient you really are with us so that we in turn might exercise that same kind of patience with others. Lord, be magnified in our lives, be magnified in this church, be exalted, O oh God, above all the earth, above all the nations. Lord, help us, encourage us, strengthen us, be our help. You are our help, O oh Lord. Every good thing is from above, and we thank you. We thank you that you have allowed us to enjoy life Sure, there have been uh, moments that have not been enjoyable, to say the least. And you have given us good things, food and drink, covering. It is with those basic things that we are to be content. You have promised to meet our every need, and we thank you. Lord, we pray that you would look with favor upon us and build us up, O oh Lord, in faith and love and hope. That you would be pleased, Lord, to add to our number with those who are like-minded of faith, who are like-minded in worshiping you and seeing the primacy of worship as utter importance in one's life. Lord, we think of our missionaries, we think of our missionary of the week, uh, Darl and Jill Powell with World Venture. Uh, thank you for tending to them and caring for them and getting them back home safely. And be with them in their ministry here. Be with them, O oh Lord, uh, and help them to be fruitful. Be with those who are wrestling with health issues, O oh Lord, and may your healing hand be with them and restoring and renewing each life. For other needs, others need work. We know that you have said that you would provide for every need and we pray that, that the need of labor, the need of putting one's hand to work would be provided. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for its welfare and for peace. 
We pray for the health and economic impact that has been had in this country. And so we also pray for those in authority over us, for wisdom and strength, for grace and faithfulness. And Lord, with continuing protests, which we embrace, but also continuing riots when, when groups within groups perhaps try to burn things down, try to cause pain and trouble. We pray for the three federal, federal officers in, in uh, Portland who were blinded by lasers. Lord, we pray that their sight would recover but they're saying that it, it may not, the site may not be recovered. We thank you for officers who go out and do their jobs and are helpful and protect and lay their lives on the line. We pray that those who run counter to that in the service of this country would be weeded out and gotten rid of. And we pray for the protesters that they would be safe and that their voices would be heard on every side. But we pray, Lord, that those who succumb to riotousness who succumb to violence and decide that they need to do that, we pray it would be brought to nothing, O oh Lord. Father and Lord, we need you more than ever now in our lives and in this country. May the church continue to stand forth and be the light that it is meant to be, that others might see it, that others might be drawn to that light, that light that pierces this awful darkness, so that the opinion of men would be laid aside for the glory of God. Now, Father, as we turn to your word, we pray that you would speak to us, speak to our hearts, encourage us, and build us up in the faith, that we might be fit vessels for your use and for your glory, for we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me, we have this week and we have next week when we finish up chapter 1 of 2 Peter. Turn with me to 2 Peter 1 verses 19 through 21 as we read those together. 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 19 through 21. Perhaps it would be good to expand that in thinking about verses 16 through 18 in which Peter says, we do not follow cleverly devised myths. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now we're trying something a little different with the slide, so if it if it uh, is more confusing or you don't like it, let me know. We can uh, reset those, but this makes it easier on both Alan and myself, so hopefully, hopefully it'll be fine and not distracting or anything. 
So as we begin thinking about this text again today and where we've been and so forth, we have been thinking about whose interpretation. Whose interpretation. And we have said that it is no personal interpretation. That is, that is uh, we've talked about the Roman Catholic view that says, no, 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 you can't have individual interpretation. Rather, you must follow the teaching of the church. You must follow what the church says about this particular scripture or passage of scripture or what have you through the magisterium. Now, I mentioned the Mormons last time, right? I mentioned uh, <clears throat> that in order to look at the scriptures, and understand them correctly, it is insofar as they are uh, translated correctly. Let me add a little piece for you here this morning. I don't know if you know this, but Joseph Smith actually set out to rewrite the scripture in terms of the correct interpretation. And he didn't get all the way done, but there are major portions of scripture that he rewrote and if you have a mind to do so you could uh, look that up online Joseph Smith's translation of the New Testament or of the Bible and it will give you those portions and then compare it with what the scriptures actually say with what he says and you'll you'll see he's giving it his own interpretation others do it as well uh, think of uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they have what? They have the New World Translation. And perhaps one of, the, one of the most familiar verses in Scripture, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And they translate it, and the Word was a God. Uh, they they buy into the old Arian heresy that Jesus was not co-equal with the Father. Then there's Islam as well. <coughs> Islam is actually, in its founding by Muhammad, is an extension of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And it's supposed to be a continuous revelation of God. But what does Islam end up having to do? Uh, they have to reinterpret redemptive history. They reinterpret the gospel. You see, Islam holds to the writings of Moses. They hold to the Psalms and they hold to what they call the gospel of Jesus. But then, but then the Quran is next in that series of revelation. And what they do is insofar as the, the other scriptures match the Quran, they're fine, but they basically say that these have been, been corrupted. What do they do ultimately? They are giving their own interpretation to redemptive history and their own interpretation to the scriptures so that it can fit with what they believe. Whose interpretation? Well, it is not supposed to be our own individual interpretation. We did give a caveat, however it is certainly true, that we do not read into scripture, even though we are allowed to interpret it for ourselves. We are not to do eisegesis, in other words. Eisegesis. Eisegesis is the reading into scripture. What you want it to mean. Taking from current events taking from our own culture, taking from things that you, are, that you know and are aware of, and reading that into the scripture. So we are not to read into it, but draw out from it the author's intent. 
And so Peter was fighting against those who espoused cleverly devised myths or tales. And what is myth again? Myth is one's own interpretation told by story. Think uh, Greek mythology, Norse mythology, uh, our own Native American mythology, all dealing with issues of how we got here, where we are going, how we are to understand the world around us, and how purpose and meaning are derived, and the ideals of what a society should be, and of the good that a society or civilization should aspire to, and those kinds of things. That's mythology. It is the imagination of men. Revelation of God and its interpretation are viewed of the same cloth we said last time and cannot be twisted to its own ends. We are not to take what it says and say, but they didn't know about this that we're dealing with in the modern era. So therefore I can countermand what it says here. No, that isn't that isn't the license that we are given. That is not how we approach it. So whose interpretation? Still another view looks at it in terms of the origins of the prophetic writings. That is to say, Peter is defending the veracity of the writings, the truthfulness of the writings, the reliability and the accuracy of what is written down, that we can trust what it says. And commentators tend to hold forth the various views and are evenly divided as to what specifically Peter is getting at. But in any case, in each of the views that we have discussed and mentioned today and last week, Peter is certainly writing against the idea that they followed, that he and the apostles followed cleverly devised tales. They did no such thing. What they encountered, what they observed, the relationship that was established with Jesus, the Christ, what he taught is not something that arose out of the, their own imaginations. As if it's another story among many and we get to just sit around and say, well, this one sounds good to me, so I'll just believe that. Peter is saying no such thing. To be sure, uh, they did not give to the writings their own interpretation, but understood the source of the writings as being from God. The source of the scripture is from God himself, and that is their view. So let's get back to the original question, whose interpretation do we follow? Do we follow those things imposed upon the scripture? Or do we look at, are we to look at, at disastrous things going on and saying, oh, this must be what he was talking about here about the last days? And we don't know. We're not told from the scripture. Modern thought and circumstance is not to be used as the basis for understanding what was written. Do we follow those things that arise then from cleverly devised tales, from the imagination of the human heart and mind? 
Do we follow the teachings of false teachers that we're going to be discussing here in a couple of weeks? who distort and twist the interpretation of the scripture to their own ends? And the answer in terms of what Peter is getting at is that we do no such thing, beloved. We do no such thing. Peter basically says we have no right to twist that which God has given to us in the prophetic writings. And it is not that which is imposed upon the writings, but that which is drawn out of the writings that we must cling to. What did Peter mean, and what did he mean to communicate by the words that he chose? You see, that's what we're after. And same for Paul, and Luke, and Matthew, and, and John, and Mark, and so on. Now we're turning the corner again. This last point in terms of the passage here before us, the reason why we must not embrace one's own interpretation of the writings. And that'll take up the rest of our time today and next week as we look at this. So as we close out our thinking about this idea of being sure of our grounding, it is appropriate to deal with the reason why we must not embrace one's own interpretation of the Holy Scripture. This section of Scripture gets at the heart of why it is that we must guard against cleverly devised tales or the mishandling of Scripture to one's own ends by the inflation of one's own thoughts. Because in contrast to those who would mishandle the word of God or follow myths or tales, the prophetic word carries with it a distinct and able difference. A distinct and able difference. And it is here where we find how it is that we can claim the scriptures, though penned by men, that is, Peter, as we're studying his letter, Peter actually took pen to paper, so to speak, and wrote out his letters. Though penned by men, finds its source or origin in God himself, in God himself. So look at what Peter says again in verse 21. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now look at, look at your text, if you have your Bibles there at 2 Peter 1. We did not follow, let's put it this way, the imagination of men when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the prophetic word, verse 19, more sure, or we have the more sure prophetic word, more sure than these cleverly devised myths. And you would do well to pay attention to it as a light in a dark place. But know this, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Why? For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Beloved, this is such an important statement in all of Scripture. This has to rank right up there. But men moved by the Holy Spirit 
spoke from God. We need to latch on to that and we need to hold it dear in our lives. Because this is what sets it off from everything else. It is important because there are various writings out there claiming to have a divine source clamoring for our attention. Even the prophet Muhammad himself does not claim to hear from God directly. Did you know that? Rather, the words are mediated through an angel, through Gabriel. God speaks, Gabriel came, he spoke, Muhammad remembered. There are many that claim to have divine source clamoring for our attention, but the question that needs to be asked, what sets it apart? What are the actual claims, you see, what are the actual claims made by other cults? In fact, personality cults, Ron L. Hubbard, Scientology, that kind of thing, and his writings and teachings are elevated above everything else. Others that hold human thought and writings up, the Bhagavad Gita in Hinduism, for instance, So not, even though there are many that claim a divine origin, not every uh, teaching that is embraced by another cult, sect, or religious thought, Buddhism, the teachings of Buddha, for instance, he does not claim that these are from God at all. And we need to understand the difference and we need to understand the issues of ultimate authority and all of the things that we have covered up to this point. And what we find here in Peter's writings is a stark contrast between the Holy Scripture as given to us by God and everything else. And the claims that are set forth in the Scripture are nowhere matched by any other uh, religious work out there that is in the writings themselves. Now, there are basically then only two sources to which we may turn concerning prophetic writings. Either there is the thought and imagination of humanity, or it is of a divine source. That is, it is from God himself. And as I thought about that, I thought this is much like what it is in the area of worship. One either worships the true and living God, or one worships the art and imagination of men. And think of Romans 1, beloved. Romans 1, 23 through 25, what did we do? We exchanged the glory of God for an image of an image of the corruptible creature. And we exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And what was the result? We worshiped the creature rather than the creator who alone is blessed forever. To this end, when Paul was in the Areopagus in Athens, he spoke in the following manner in Acts 17, verse 29. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. You see what he's getting at? formed by the art and thought of man. Now we may not, especially in secular circles, they don't go around necessarily carving things and saying this is our God, but what do they do? The thought of man. 
and they create God or spirituality or what have you in different ways according to the creature and not according to the creator. And in the time just before the Babylonian exile, we hear from the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 23, verse 16, thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into futility. Why? They speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. Beloved, this has been going on since time immemorial, since Adam and Eve walked the earth. It was either the art and imagination of man or the mind of God. So, so it is with those who follow cleverly devised tales and engage in false teaching. The source of it all is found in human imagination, found in a corrupt heart, out of a heart that has exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And Peter is setting forth an argument to help us see that it is not human imagination that we are following, but rather the source of the writings are found in God. That is, they are found in his mind and heart. So you can either follow the mind and thought and imagination of man, or you can follow the thought, mind, and knowledge of God from his heart. Which is to say that when we began this series within a series concerning the firm prophetic word, Peter is embracing the self-attesting ontological trinity as the precondition of everything else. And you say, well, the word trinity isn't even used there with Peter. How do you know that? Well, once again, look at verse 17. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, that's obviously the Father who's called the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son whom I, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And he also received honor and glory from God the Father. God does not share his glory in that way with another. There's the second person of the Trinity. He can only be God himself if he is receiving such honor and glory from the Father. So where's the third person of the Trinity? Well, he's in verse 21. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. How does the Holy Spirit know what he should say through the apostles, for instance? Do you know what God should say through another person? No, it's not given to you. But the Holy Spirit knows. How can he know? Because he knows the mind of God. And who knows the mind of God in its fullness except for God himself? And there's your three persons of the Trinity. One God, co-equal in three persons. And because Peter embraced that, he is able to set forth these things the way he does. So Peter tells us it is very important, beloved, for us to understand that no prophecy spoken or written finds as its source in the human will. It was, 
No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. Thinking is an act. I will to think in a certain way. And Peter says, no prophecy finds as its source the human will. And so I cringe at the thought when standing before the Lord, those who had claimed to speak a word from him will be told in no uncertain terms by the Lord himself, I never said that and I never told you to say that. <clears throat> Beloved, that is why it is so crucial that we stick with the word that is right before us. That is right before us and not what we imagine God might say in a given circumstance, but what he actually does say. And we should let that weigh upon our hearts because when we say this is what God says, we need to make sure that we get it right. We need to get it right. And this can only be done rightly if the source of it is God himself found in the scriptures. As we bring our thoughts to a close this morning... Beloved, this is one of those times wherein we face an either-or decision. What or who will we listen to and follow? The supposed autonomous mind and imagination of men? Thinking, oh, that makes sense to me, and this is how we should understand the world and where we came from and where we're heading, and we don't have any thing to fear after death. You can just live your own life. And what they're really saying is you can just be your own little God. Well, that's idolatry, beloved. So will we settle for myth? Will we settle for the wisdom of men? Or Will we embrace the absolute authority of the mind and knowledge of God? Will we aspire to learn the word of God? Will we aspire to seeking God's wisdom for all of life, honoring the ultimacy of his authority? <clears throat> I didn't have this in the notes presented, but I want to add a little something. You need to understand that you don't get to decide which is which. In other words, you don't get to decide whether God's word is right and carries the weight of authority inherent within him, or whether the myth of men is right and carries the weight of authority within it. It's already been decided. The myth of men is not right, and it does not carry the weight of authority inherent within it. The decision comes, which will you submit to? Will you embrace the living and true God? Or will you embrace some form of the creature and the thought and imagination of men? Will you stand in terms of your life upon that foundation of the opinion of men or the mind and heart of God that carries all weight and all authority? Lord, may we in our own hearts and lives embrace you and your word. May we fight to reject the imagination and thought of men. But may we embrace the mind and thought of God. Lord, keep us in your word and keep us by your word. 
And may you, through the ministry of the word, confirm in our own hearts and lives its veracity. It is true and living and abiding. May it come to realization more fully in each of our lives. And we'll give you the glory and praise through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember, a, remember the offering by...